For this lesson, we'll be focusing on oscillators. Now, an oscillator is a circuit that generates a waveform, a time varying output, by converting direct current to alternating current. And typical oscillators are created by using positive feedback loops in which the signal sustains itself and continues a sinusoidal output. Now, usually when you look up oscillators, there's two subtypes. There's the feedback or harmonic type, and then there's a rela relaxation type. We'll be focusing on the feedback type because anytime you look at any of your PE references, it mostly considers oscillators as the feedback type. Relaxation type is where you go and look for square waves and triangle waves. You might see this more in the digital uh, side of things or digital systems versus the electronic side. Within the PE references and textbooks, the first thing that comes up when referring to oscillators is the Barkhausen criteria. The Barkhausen criteria states there are two requirements for oscillation. The loop voltage gain must be equal to one or unity, and your loop phase shift must be equal to zero or at least have a 360 degrees. Now for the illustration below on the left, we have an amplifier and it has a feedback loop going through beta and it's creating a closed loop circuit in which we have our gain of equal to one. And to the right, I'm just showing you a little phase shift oscillator that kind of shows you divided up using a color code that to the right we have our amplifier, which is our gain, and then we have our oscillation circuit to our left, which is our beta. And when you multiply those together, it should be at least give you a closed loop gain of equal to one. So the first oscillator we'll be going over is the Hartley oscillator. Now just to give you a heads up, all the oscillators in this lesson are common oscillators found in majority of the textbooks. There are various types of oscillators that can be used in different configurations. However, I just picked the common ones. So the Hartley oscillator uses a pair of tapped inductors in parallel with a capacitor in its feedback network to produce the 180 degree phase shift required for oscillation. So on the left, we have a BJT amplifier, which you may be familiar with in the BJT lesson. And on the right, beta, we have our inductors in parallel with a capacitor. And if you wanna find your resonant frequency, all you would need to know is your inductors as well as your capacitor. Our next oscillator we have is the phase shift oscillator. Now this is a very common oscillator to come across, not just when looking up oscillators, but you might also find some of your op amp books because the phase shift oscillator uses three RC circuits in its feedback network to produce the 180 degrees phase shift, as well as it utilizes a amplifier op amp. So if you see on the illustration below, to the right, we have a amplifier via op amp, and then we have our three stages of our RC circuits. And you can find your resonant frequency with the equations given to the right, and also be aware you can have multiple RC st stages, and the more stages you have, that will also affect your resonant frequency. The next common oscillator we have is the Weinbridge oscillator. Now this particular one is unique because in the circuit below, this was pulled out of one of the textbooks. However, there's other textbooks that have the circuit configured as almost like a Wheatstone bridge configuration. That's the way it mimics. So the Weinbridge oscillator has two feedback paths, a positive feedback path and a negative feedback. The positive feedback path used to produce oscillation, which you see in beta, which is your resistor and your capacitor, and then you have the negative feedback, which is used to create your closed loop gain. Next, we have the Colpitz oscillator. Now this one is gonna kind of mimic the Hartley oscillator, just in a different way. For this one, it's still an LC circuit. However, it uses a pair of tap capacitors and an inductor to produce its oscillation. So same as the Hartley on the left, we have our BJT as an amplifier, and to the right in beta, we have our oscillation circuit using two capacitors and an inductor. And again, you can use the equation to the right to find your resonant frequency. And of course, like most of my lessons, I save the best slide for last. For this one, it's the crystal controlled oscillators. Now crystal controlled oscillator uses quartz crystals to produce an extremely stable output frequency. You'll usually see these type of oscillators with microprocessors. Anytime you refer to clock speed on small microprocessors, they use quartz crystals. Now for quartz crystals, the symbol you see to the left is the most common one you'll see most, among most uh, schematics. But it also is kind of equates to using two capacitors, an inductor, and a resistor. Now here's where the interesting part comes in. It can be used in a series configuration or parallel configuration. If it's in series, it acts as a series resonance circuit. And that means it's in series with an LC circuit, and it's in, which means you have a load capacitor in series with it. And then your parallel configuration means your load capacitor is in parallel with it. 
it's creating a negative reactance. Now, anytime it's in the series mode, your crystal is purely resistive, and in parallel mode, purely inductive. And of course, based on its configuration, that would determine how to, what equation you got to use to find your resonant frequency. And those are the equations we have to the right. All right, let's jump right in with an easy one to get our feet wet. For this one, we want to determine the resonant frequency for the falling oscillator. Well, if you refer to the power points, this oscillator right here resembles a phase shift oscillator with a slight little bit of a twist. Now on that particular slide, it showed the phase shift oscillator with only three sets of RC circuits. Well, for this one, we actually have an extra set. We have four sets of RC circuits. Each pair is considered to be a set. So in this case, we won't be using the typical equation given in most of your books. For this one, since we have an extra set, we're going to be mostly focusing on this equation right here. So let's go ahead and do what we normally do. Let's log what we know. For our capacitor, we have C equals, and all the capacitors are equal. It's going to be 2.25 nanofarads, and that's 10 to the negative 9. And our resistance, again, our resistors are also the same, so that one's an easy one. It's going to be 5 kilo ohms. So a lot of this is going to be just plug and chugging for this particular one. So resonant frequency, and again, we're using this guy right here is going to equal 1 over, and it's going to be 2 pi, and then the square root of 2 times the number of pairs times your resistance and your capacitance. Now, when we're referring to the PowerPoint, remember, n is the number of sets. So keep on moving along, 1 over 2 pi, and the number of sets for this one is 2 times one, two, three, four, four sets. And then times RC, which is going to be 5K times 2.25 nanofarads. And I'll see what I can do about keeping my handwriting somewhat clean. And if we multiply those two guys together, I'll tell you what I'll bring it down here. Resonant frequency equals 1 over 2 pi, square root of 8. And if I multiply 5K times the 2.25 nanofarads, it's going to give me, I'll put it in parentheses here, 1.125 times 10 to negative 5. And then close parentheses. And I think the rest of this we can plug and chug in the calculator since we have all our variables. And that's going to give us a final answer of 5,000 and 1.76 hertz. And we can just go ahead and round that and say it's going to be 5 kilohertz. So that was a relatively easy one. So our final answer, F of R, resonant frequency, is 5 kilohertz. All right, this was enough to get our feet wet. Let's go do another one. All right, for this next example here, I wanted to go ahead and throw another curveball at you. For this one, we also want to determine the resonant frequency of the falling oscillator. However, when you refer to the PowerPoints, it's not going to exactly a copy and paste of your typical oscillators. Because in some of your textbooks, they might actually take one of your oscillators and make it configured a little bit different. It may not look like a typical setup you're used to. Sometimes they like to either simplify it down or cram all of it in one area or just make it easy to the actual author of the book themselves. Because this particular setup was actually in one of my other PE references. I just wanted to use it. That way you can get familiar with different configurations. Well, looking through the PowerPoint slides, which one does this resemble? Well, right off the bat, we know it's not Hartley, and we know it's not Calpitz. But if you look at this really close, you can see right here that it has an op amp, and then coming from the output has a resistor going to the negative input, and then a resistor going to ground. And then also coming out of the output, you have a capacitor in series with a resistor going down to a resistor and a capacitor going through parallel to ground. Well, this would actually resemble the Wien bridge right here. So just looking at this and kind of deriving how the diagram looks, you could see that this matches this particular oscillator. So we're going to use this formula right here to determine the resonant frequency. Now looking at this right here, we have R1 and C1. So this would be R1, this would be C1, and this is R2, C2. And then over here in parallel with each other, we have R2 and then C2. 
So looking over here, we can use either one of these equations right here because R1 equals R2 and C1 equals C2. Um, so right here we can say our resistance equals 10 kilo ohms and our capacitance equals 663 picofarad. And if you don't know, remember what picofarad is, that's 10 to the negative 12. So this one is another plug and chug, but we just had that little speed bump at the beginning. That's all. So right here, I'm going to say our resonant frequency equals 1 over 2 pi. And I could pick either one of these. It's going to be the same regardless. So it's going to be 10 kilo ohms times 663 picofarad. And I think I can just plug and chug this in my calculator. And that's going to give me an answer of... 24,005.27 hertz. And of course, we can round and say that's 24 kilohertz. And that right there is going to be our final answer for this particular oscillator. Let's go ahead and do one more example. All right, for our last one, save the best for last. This one, we want to determine the mounting capacitor of the falling circuit for a 20 megahertz crystal oscillator equivalent. Well, if we refer to the PowerPoint, this area right here, let's see if I can get it all, is where our crystal oscillator equivalent would be. Now there's one little curveball in here. Our load capacitor is actually in parallel with this oscillator. So when you have that, you need to pay attention to which equation you're going to use based on your load capacitor. Also, your mounting capacitor is this guy right here. Anytime uh, it refers to your mounting capacitor, it's this particular guy right here. Well, let's see if we can work this down. Of course, we're going to write down what we know. C1 is 2 picofarad. L1 is 44.328 microhenries. Of course, our resistance is 10 ohms. And our mounting capacitor is unknown as of yet. And our load capacitor is in parallel. So it looks like this is in a parallel resonant configuration. So which means we're going to be using this equation right here. So let's go ahead and see if we can work that down. So we know right away our resonant frequency is going to have to be 20 megahertz. I'll try to work on my handwriting. Equals, and it's going to be 1 over, it's going to be 2 pi. And then the square root of L1C1. So L1 is 44.328 microhenries. And then times C1, which is 2 picofarad. And picofarad is times 2 to the negative 12. And then, let's see if we can continue on, times the square root of 1 plus C1, again, 2 picofarad, over your mounting capacitor. So we'll leave it just like that. Well, the first thing I want to do is let me go ahead and multiply this inductor times this capacitor. So I'll bring this down. I'll say 20 megahertz equals 1 over 2 pi square root. And we'll go ahead and multiply those two together. And that's going to give us 8.866 times 10 to negative 17. And of course, I'll keep it going. 1 plus 2 picofarad over your mounting capacitor. And it looks like I used up almost all my space. Tell you what, let me see if I can make a little bit of room here. Tell you what, I'll see if I can write a little smaller so that way we can follow along. So we have 20 megahertz equals... And I'll do 2 pi times the square root of 8.866 times 10 to the negative 17. So that's 1 over, and it's going to be 5.916 times 10 to the negative 8. And of course, times the square root of 1 plus 2 pico over your mounting capacitor. I'll tell you what I can do next is, just to get rid of this guy right here, I can multiply the 5.916 times 10 to the negative 8 times 20 megahertz. So if I multiply those two together, it's going to give me 
1.183, and that's going to equal the square root of 1 plus 2 picofarad over your mounting capacitor. And of course, I can keep going. I can square both sides just to get rid of that square root. So if I square this guy right here, it's going to be 1.399, and that's going to equal 1 plus 2 picofarad over your mounting capacitor. And I'll tell you what, let me make room one more time. All right, moving on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this 1. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. So I don't need a calculator for that, so I can just get rid of this 1 right here. So it's 0.399 equals 2 picofarad over your mounting capacitor. And what I can do is just make it easy on myself. I'm going to use a little algebra and switch those two around. So which means my mount capacitance is 2 picofarad over 0.399. And the rest of it's just a plug and chug, and that's going to give me an answer of 5.01310 to the negative 12. And we can go ahead and round and say that's approximately 5 picofarads. So that is our final answer for our mounting capacitor. All right, so hopefully this is enough information here to get your feet wet as far as identifying the oscillators and how to calculate them. They're fairly simple. It's just a few things to be aware of when you're trying to find your calculations and know how to find your resonant frequency. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know, and I will hope you all have a good day.